If it's around the intergenerational effects of the residential school directly, it would be fine to start teasing some questions into that area to say, I've been made aware of the impacts of the residential school. I've been made aware that it was very traumatizing for some people, that we do know that it impacts the individual throughout their life. I'm wondering if this is something that's a part of your life, right? So I've just framed a very indirect way of asking. That's Dr. Lindsay Crowshoe, primary care physician, assistant dean of Indigenous health at the University of Calgary, and a member of the Pekani First Nation. He's our guest on Around the Room, the Canadian Rheumatology Association podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Ennis. Today, we're doing the second of our interviews on Indigenous health in Canada. For this interview, I'm handing over hosting duties to Dr. Raheem Karani, a rheumatologist and colleague of mine here at UBC and the chair of the CRA's Education Committee. Over to you, Raheem. Thank you very much, Daniel, for giving me the privilege of passing the mic to me. I'm going to try and fill those big shoes and be able to uh, take the opportunity to introduce our members and our audience to Dr. Lindsay Croshu. Dr. Croshu is a Blackfoot family physician in the Calgary area, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to interviewing him today. Welcome to Around the Room, Dr. Lindsay Croshu. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here. Lindsay, can you give us a few sentences of introduction about yourself? Sure. My name is Lindsay. I'm a family doctor, and I'm from uh, one of the Blackfoot tribes in southern Alberta, the Pagani Nation, and uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Calgary. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine, and I'm an assistant dean of Indigenous Health within the Indigenous Local Global Health Office. Um, I have a focus on on many things Indigenous, whether it's research, teaching, health service, uh, all of the above. Fantastic. What made you interested in doing work with rheumatologists? Oh, the story of how I'm involved. <laughs> so so uh, on the one <laughs> hand, uh, it was Cheryl who asked me to come on board, Dr. Cheryl Barnaby. She asked me to come on board um, in order to provide a uh, a, a knowledge uh, a framework, a model of care framework um, that was based in the research that I had uh, done as part of an international project that was connected with New Zealand and Australia called Educating for Equity. Um, Cheryl felt, um, Dr. Barnaby felt it was uh, no need to reinvent uh, the wheel in, um, in providing care um, in my uh, sort of conversations with her, I, I agreed. There's much to explore around what is cultural safety and cultural competency and structural competency and what are the domains of knowledge that doctors need to have and all of these aspects can be very complex and overwhelming and what does it fundamentally mean? Um, we, uh, we felt that uh, sharing a, uh, a, a knowledge uh, framework that was focused on a different chronic disease was was totally totally um, uh, reliable and valid and and had uh, uh, had very similar sort of social and cultural constructs. Um, so that was why why am I interested? Interested is the knowledge framework that I have negotiated. I feel is uh, is not. I didn't necessarily build it for diabetes. It was just diabetes is a very um, effective way to look at the social cultural aspects that drive chronic disease in indigenous populations and diabetes itself is very driven by social factors so seeing those connections in a context of diabetes is very logical and it is a health issue that's you know fundamentally important for indigenous peoples to understand and make sense of and address um my interest is understanding how how a a knowledge construct um, applies to other disease sort of contexts. And um, in that knowledge, how does it become reinforced? What things are resonant with uh, other, other, other practitioners? What things are, are unique? And um, I'm just interested in it, evolving it and making sure that it is sound, and, you know, very rigorous. And it's all pro- part of the process of, of uh, knowledge exchange. So, um, yeah. so maybe from a researcher perspective, I'm I, I, I was interested because I wanted to make sure that I did it in a very effective 
thorough way in many different populations, in many different contexts, with many different providers, to ensure that the robustness of the of the the, the concept and the construct was sound. And I wanted to ensure, uh, in my commitment to to the world, that I engage in ongoing knowledge exchange with um, with uh, many different types of uh, people. Right, so it's kind of part of my responsibilities back to community, which is indigenous and our healthcare profession and all that kind of stuff. So that's the long, long answer. Is <laughs> is uh, I have responsibilities that I want to make sure that I live up to to both uh, you as a profession, uh, rheumatologist, yeah. as a and uh, to the practice of medicine, to indigenous community, and to research and to the knowledge itself. So. It's been a really um, interesting journey for me over the last four years that we've had a chance to work together on this along with the others in the group. Um, and one of the things I've seen is certainly benefit uh, with our patients um, and seeing other rheumatologists seeing benefit. As a family physician in your own practice, have you seen benefit with the rheumatologists actually getting a chance to engage with this material and being able to engage with their indigenous patients more closely. I'm a bit of a few steps away from seeing the practices of rheumatologists. I even Dr. Barnaby, who works in my clinic, I don't see her day to day. I, I only see her in, in research and administrative world. Um, I, I see her consult notes very briefly um, as she describes, but I, she's already kind of interconnected in this world of this indigenous social cultural sort of world. So I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I'm quite a few steps away from knowing um, what, what, what rheumatologists uh, do and engage and how they engage and the out- outcomes of, of this work. So um, it's very difficult for me to answer. It seems to me that I've had a few patients that are not connected to Dr. Barnaby that have, are connected to, to, um, to rheumatologists that uh, we've trained seems like those patients have been super happy to stay connected with those um, with those individuals and um, that's uh, so I have limited knowledge of it no worries I I've certainly talked to patients about the initiative and when I've talked to them about it uh, and in particular indigenous patients they've been really excited to hear about the the effort that uh, that you and and rheumatologists across the country have been putting forward in, in uh, trying to become better attuned and and better educated and better able to assist Indigenous patients. Yeah, so as part of our actual research project, when we did this for, to family doctors and, and measured um, the outcomes, we actually connected with patients and we created this, this, uh, this scale. Uh, to some, it, it felt like uh, both doctors and patients felt the, the relationships were, were, were enhanced and that, that they're exploring and connecting in, in areas that they didn't typically connect in um, because of, you know, the, the, the very much the social realms and um, very much the uh, the cultural realm. So um, I guess it's something for rheumatology to think about. It gives us kind of permission to be able to explore that, connect with patients and develop that, uh, that way of being able to cross cultural barriers or, or, uh, or perhaps differences and even explore similarities with each other. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that the other day, um, and today uh, had a medical student who um, super great, super nice, and was so apologetic that she's spending so much time with the patients, and and I'm sure the patients are just loving it that they have somebody to chat with, and uh, but she didn't know how to navigate a whole host of complex areas and how to how to work through things, and um, felt that um, uh, tangents were very big in nature and that took lots of time. So we had a conversation just about this right um, knowing that there are many many social cultural uh, contexts that one could explore that make sense to understand the nature of uh, presenting health issue health concern um, and to make sense of how we can then better engage with the patient and um, have better outcomes uh, regarding that chronic disease issue um, we we just chatted about a strategy but noticed that that um, medical training difficult definitely does not give the basic structure. It gives really basic structures, and she felt like the fife was really not enough. And so I said, well, the, the framework allows one to see these possibilities, but still, nonetheless, you do four basic things. You screen, 
explore, you acknowledge that sort of interconnection, and then you figure out how do you support. Some of these things you might have to shelve, right? Um, and say, you got to move along. But, and, but some of these things, you, you say, yeah, it's, they, they make a connection. Let's explore it a bit together and see how we can help to connect this to the clinical care that's relevant at the moment. So um, it's, a, it's a navigation. But if you don't have a structure to do it within, you, you don't know where to go. Can you expand a little bit more on that structure? Because that may help. And I have a couple of specific questions later to be able to chat that rheumatologists and other health professionals have asked me that they've uh, been concerned about with trying to set up that first visit uh, or engagement uh, effectively. Right. So relationship uh, is kind of a context to, to build and think about, as well as um, the kind of, as I allude to, the the social and cultural domains that a person lives within that influences um, their their health and their 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 access to healthcare, uh, the type of um, aspects that they do for self care and wellness and addressing and ma- and being engaged in the and a management plan that we as doctors could provide. Um, the uh, the structure is is thinking through the idea that. Um, uh, from a patient-centered approach, the patient world, the patient's world is critical, and what is it in that patient's world that influences their their capacity to be well, or their influences their their current disease or health issue status? Um, and if you if you don't have a a way to understand their lived experience, we tend not to take a look at it. We don't. We tend not to engage with it. We focus on a whole host of biomedical indicators within our within our the approach that we take, and that's that's our bread and butter. It's like what we have to do. Um, I I'm just uh, arguing. I challenge us to say that there is a whole host of social aspects that seem to be really relevant to the nature of how a uh, a patient experiences their um, their uh, their world and their health issue, and by um, understanding the interplay, we can help to, to facilitate the uh, the the um, addressing some of the roadblocks that get in the way for people to to be well with with say rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes or depression or the patient that I was with today, which was an alcohol use disorder and was withdrawing and it took me a long time to help find supports and work things out. The, uh, the structure that I started to see when I did my work across Canada with Indigenous peoples with diabetes and clinicians who focused care to Indigenous patients with diabetes um, was that there is this interplay of the experiences of colonization, how it imparts stress, how it imparts a difficulties in, one, in one's life directly and indirectly. And uh, what I was seeing in that was that there is um, there's a, a series of categories that seem to make be a part of this this um, lived experience, and one was resources, right? Uh, poverty, and how poverty drives a whole host of health behaviors and access to resources that then um, are not there that could help prevent them and make them well and be part of a bigger picture of doing doing better in life. Um, um, and so poverty was, uh, was central. It was big. It was individually experienced, and it was collectively experienced at the same time. So it was just not one's individual income or one's family income that then generated like food insecurity or housing insecurity. But it was like collectively in the community. So resources pervasively was were uh, were definitely uh, distinctly um, distinctly less in 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 the the the, the Patients, the people that I engaged with, um, and it seems to ring true in the um, patients that I've seen over the course of my lifetime, and rung true with the clinicians that I connected with across Canada, and still rings true with every clinician that I work with. Um, poverty as a, a resource at an individual and at a collective level influences health and health outcomes directly. So, understanding that the context of that, the cyclic nature of it, the influence on um, behaviors. The influence on stress, all that is critical. But there is another domain that started to arise within the within um, our data was that there was a psychosocial interplay of the social environment that um, people are living within that can be very strong and powerful and supportive, or and and or at the same time can be very undermining, right? And uh, 
a lot of the stress was toxic in nature um, that arose from uh, histories of residential school, that arose from the nature of relationships that one has in community with family, um, amongst community members. It um, it can be as difficult as being um, uh, having no resources in one's life. But the issue was that it was very accumulative, right? Um, as uh, so, poverty, resource disparities collectively synergized with a whole host of psychosocial adver- adversaries, uh, adver- adversive experiences, as we can understand these from a maybe a adverse childhood experiences lens um, um, through the lifespan. So, as these things accumulated in life, they were synergistic in their effect, and they combined to be very, like, very, very difficult in a person's life. Um, sort of creating that level of toxicity that makes it hard for one to be well. And then all of a sudden it, it influences how we can cope with our health issues, right? Um, the third the third dimension that we start to see was that these things uh, seem to come from somewhere and it was um, the impacts of, of colonization um, through racism within our system, right? Specifically our system, right? Because you know, educational systems, policing systems, judicial systems, all are part of the psychosocial realm and influence the, you know, the resources that one gets. Um, but um, the impacts of all of those forces of um, colonization um, seem to, to coalesce within our healthcare system in certain ways. Um, so uh, power, authority, uh, stereotyping, racism that translated into uh, not great care, unequal treatment uh, within the way that um, patients experience their world. So uh, experience or healthcare, sorry. Um, so that was the basic structure that we we're starting to see. And by having a, a structure and a host of categories, we felt that um, you, you had a bit of a a, a, a a map or a framework to say, hey, maybe is this a part of your life? Uh, and if so, let's figure something out. Um, and if you ask a person, maybe is this part of your life? And they say, no, that's okay. It's not. It's it's cool. It's, at least you have a, an under, it shows that you have an understanding and an interest versus being completely blind to it, right? You know, there's like the, the unconscious <laughs> incompetence moving into uh, conscious incompetence to moving into conscious competence yes. and then super confidence. If you have no resource to move along this, 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 uh, this spectrum, then we, get, we stay stuck, right? Um, so that's kind of where this stuff comes from. Um, there's a cultural lens as well to this, which is really around um, not a Western pers- um, provider's culture, but we do, the framework asks us all to make sense of who we are and, and what we're bringing into that relationship, into that inter- that, uh, that interpretive lens that we, that we speak through when we engage with the patient. But this one is looking and understanding that there's a whole host of indigenous ways of knowing that make a big difference in, in the patient's outcome. So it's it's a bit on the light side because you can go very deep, very far, and try to comprehend and understand indigenous culture and ways of knowing and being. Um, I've uh, we felt that we needed to 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 keep that that framework relatively um, more simplistic and and more accessible to clinicians, and and in doing so, we have a host of frames that help to facilitate those things that knowledge and and approaches and things within a cultural realm that make a bigger difference and health outcomes difference for um, for and with indigenous peoples. And those very same cultural concepts make a difference in the way that you engage um, um, and build relationship and communicate with indigenous peoples. So that's the basic structure. It's the yin and yang of cultural colonization with two directives that say, just do these two simple things, thinking about that yin and yang, um, do these two things, recenter one's relationship, thinking about how colonization has historically undermined and the expectations of indigenous peoples for, for Western doctors to, to behave in that way of, uh, you know, not being great, being racist and all that kind of stuff. But think about how indigenous culture could help to reframe that relationship if you were to learn about it and think about how, if you could reflect on your own, own cultural origin and the things that you uh, could bring into that relationship that can make that 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 connection to be super interesting, right? Um, I think Indigenous peoples are, are are always like, "Wow, your background's super cool too." I'd love to hear a bit more about it. So recenter one's relationship, thinking about the undermining effect of colonization and the 
the facilitation of how culture in a, in a humble way can help to make it better um, and, uh, and um, engage in the patient's social reality. So that's the basic of the, of the structure. There's two simple directives, a, a kind of a, a ethical space to work within, and then a whole structure around it that, that, um, that we uh, have been teaching through this uh, course. And so what I'm hearing is that we need to think about culture, think about colonization, inequity, and healthcare, and then be able yeah. to try and help with recentering that relationship as we move forward with that patient on the journey. And in doing that, one of the questions that I had, I said I had alluded to a couple of questions that I've had from rheumatologists and, and allied health professionals about this, uh, have been about how do we ask about the impact of residential schools that you brought up on patients and their families on the first visit when yeah. it's just the first time we've met them. Can you give us an example of how that might be done? We've done a lot of work with community to make sense of, of, of this, this context and um, lots of different opinions, right? Every person you ask has, uh, <laughs> uh, has a varied opinion. Um, the, the theme that, that seems to crop up out of these conversations is that um, there's a balance, that there's an expectation for, for healthcare providers to know that this is an entity or this is a thing, right? Um, and, that, and that at the same time, it, they want uh, that it to be acknowledged that it is a potential thing, but not to be a tourist, right? To like, to, 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 to explore that uh, areas that, that doesn't feel safe for them. So there's a balance that the community is asking for. Be aware mm -hmm. that it is a possibility, right? Be aware that it is a possibility for them in particular, right? Um, but don't be a voyeur at the same time. Um, but if it's a relevant aspect, um, start to engage. So the, the, the concept is that, um, there, if acknowledging that a history of adversity or trauma is part of the story, that's the starting point. And then starting to ask, so wh mm -hmm. where does it come from, right? What are the what are the what are the what are the adverse life experiences that are framing kind of your wellness at the moment, and the things that you're trying to work through that makes it hard for you to uh, to cope with rheumatoid arthritis, right? So that's the conversation. If if it is um, if it if it is around the the uh, intergenerational effects of the mm -hmm. residential school directly, if they were of that generation, I think it would be it would be a fine to start sort of sort of teasing some questions into that area to say and which is more around. I've been made aware of the impacts of the residential school, right? I've been made aware that it's, it can be very, it was very stressful for some people. It's very traumatizing for some people. And that, um, that we do know that it, it impacts, um, the individual throughout their life. I'm, I'm wondering if this is something that's a part of your life, right? So I've just framed a very indirect way of asking. So I don't think you can get there until you have some degree of rapport with the person and you've uncovered some degree of of uh, adversity in their life that might be psychosocial in nature that they're making some sense of that often it's like not clearly s spoken of. So on, on the first visit, um, I think it would be okay for you to say, Hey, I've, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been, I've been learning more around, around, uh, around, uh, indigenous health and peoples and colonization I think it's it's been important for me as a clinician to do so because of because I want to do the best I can and knowing the the mm -hmm. the, the uh, you could use whatever whatever mm -hmm. argument you want like the truth and reconciliation is asking us to to engage yes. with the the truths that are out there and and how healthcare can undermine um, the wellness of an individual by you know racism and all that kind of stuff but if uh, but also healthcare needs to connect and do a better job regarding the uh, legacy of residential schools. Um, I, I just want to do the best I can. So I'd, I'd love to be able to, uh, if, if you're ready to have a conversation, I, 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 I see that there's often a connection of adverse life experiences to 
to being well and coping with um, your disease, with one's disease, uh, I'd be willing to help to, to engage and support as part of the, our relationship together. So if you can get to the essence of that or start that, I think it's, it's not just like a checkbox, say I, I've done, I've asked about residential school, but it's, um, it's a new, a more nuanced approach that, that and very indirect, right? I've certainly uh, seen that, uh, that when we've been in a safe space with a patient and been able to engage with them and that there's an expression of comfort being able to talk about some of these adverse life experiences that patients have, uh, when I've asked them about it, even at that first visit, have been uh, comfortable with sharing and being able to uh, explore that a little bit um, so that they know that I care and and uh, and that there's an opportunity to explore that maybe even in the future, uh, if if needed. That's like that's like a a, a very, very, uh, very cultural principle that I, I see as important is yes. the is reciprocation, right? Of um, of the ability to share of oneself in response to another's sharing um, that is mirrored, and so without that reciprocation, uh, our our, our relationships from an indigenous point of view not tend to get blocked because then we don't build that trust. So they, um, that's something that as a, as a cultural context or a cultural concept that, that I um, advocate for in the way that we work with indigenous patients. But all patients likely is uh, a bit of uh, reciprocation in the way that we build our relationships is key. So that sharing is is a great strategy. Thanks, Raheem. And would you say in a similar way, if we were to talk as rheumatologists and explore Indigenous traditions or ceremonies, that it would be in a similar framework to what you were talking about with residential schools? Or would it be slightly different? I consider the idea of ceremony as a as a place where people um, engage and um, potentially connect, and um, those things facilitate wellness, right? Social cohesion, uh, uh, good, strong social connections. So you have a big social group around you that that are help you to connect and be well together. Um, there's a whole host of complex things that that's part of. So one's engagement with um, with ceremony for me speaks to social cohesion. I often use that to see to what extent does one have this resilience factor in their life. And ceremony is one indicator. Although I ask many other questions to understand their social cohesion, their social connections and those things that maybe are very positive in their life, or maybe that there that they're, there's some gaps, right? And those are modifiable things that I, I tease, uh, tease some information about and then help support. So asking about... Um, um, access to ceremony is one indicator of that. Um, also, asking about access to ceremony um, can also um, can also be kind of uh, challenging to many people, mm-hmm. right? They may find that I don't feel indigenous enough, and therefore feel excluded, and all that kind of stuff. So you might you might be um, sort of stepping into a domain that's very complex to navigate. Um, the idea here is that. Um, through colonization, we've all have been impacted as indigenous peoples, and and um, uh, and that impact is uh, to disrupt our, our cultural identities and our access to cultural resources, as um, as our communities have been disrupted because of residential school and all that kind of stuff. So that leaves many indigenous people very um, very vulnerable in this in this question, yeah. right? Um, so it has to be done in a in, in a way, so so the the framing of the rationale is that um, I've come to understand that one's connection to indigenous identity and um, and col- uh, and connected to that is c- one's connection to indigenous culture and connected to that is one's connection to ceremony is a very very uh, helps to facilitate wellness in general. And many of my patients find it's very important for them to access that resource in their healing journey, right? And and in particular, if, um, if there is some sort of traditional approach that is very, very, um, very, very well known uh, around some disease or something or other, it's it's important. 
but often just connecting with elders and basic ceremonies is is like from a population health sense very very um, supportive of being well yeah right so the idea here is that by by framing it in a way that says this is a resource um, to what extent are you accessing it that's diagnostic information for me to what extent do you have mm-hmm. barriers to it which is like a supportive uh, context to me which um, to what extent would you like to to access this and why and what is the journey then that is kind of a that that third pathway is is a is a pathway that one has to know a bit about so so if you don't know a bit about this um, you can probably do the first one yes. more easily and the last one that I described or the second one that I described but this third pathway is you, you have to have a bit of knowledge around the around the navigation of it so you have to be clear as to why are you asking this question for me understanding one's one's enculturation into my community because that is a marker of social cohesion and uh, and uh, it's really important and um if one if uh, if you're asking to say say hey this is a this seems to be a a uh, a uh, a good thing maybe i can help you you gotta know a little about about that good thing right <laughs> um so so that's the complexity of this one. It is, uh, it is core to the day-to-day work that I see with the, the patients that I see. And, and often it is very indirect when I ask because they're often very fragile about it because um, there are many barriers for us as Indigenous peoples to access this. And lots of judgment by Western society and Indigenous society of those who have those barriers. So um, how do I... Uh, it, help people to engage in this is is in a, in a clinic that's that's um that's uh, very gentle questions and um and i just acknowledge and then see if i can support in some way or another and those conversations are very relevant to say anybody else that's not a non-indigenous provider we'll be right back to around the room after this brief message from the cra did you know that membership with the canadian rheumatology association offers outstanding value through knowledge sharing, accredited educational offerings, advocacy, and research support. Members receive access to free webinars, programs, and discounts to events such as the CRA Review Course and Annual Scientific Meeting. Members also receive complimentary subscriptions to the Journal of Rheumatology and the Journal of the Canadian Rheumatology Association. Trainees can join for free and are eligible for educational and training opportunities, travel bursaries, and much more. These are just some of the many benefits of joining the Canadian Rheumatology Association. And if you're an existing member, spread the word to rheumatology colleagues who haven't joined yet. They'll thank you for it. For more information, please visit our website at www.room.ca. And now, back to Around the Room. We've talked uh, about a number of uh, uh, strategies to help our rheumatologists and provided them a framework in our discussion today, which has been really fruitful. Are there any additional strategies you would recommend that might make it possible for rheumatologists to connect with their Indigenous patients? Oh, uh, plenty. Basics, I think, are being humble in the moment. I think patients want to feel heard, like we all probably want the same thing is to be heard. I think patients want to make sure that they they don't feel stereotyped, right? So an authentic uh, conversation, an authentic relationship. Um, I think that those are important. I think that there's a, a lot of, uh, of resistance when there's a, an authoritarian voice, um, right? So, so power and privilege and all that kind of stuff. The way that you sort of portray yourself and the way that you talk about knowledge right um, so if you're if you're if your approach is very very top down um, and not patient centered or relationship centered um, and that last one is probably the, one of the most important is like the nature of the relationship and what you bring to that relationship and how you self reflect on that relationship if you can if you can start building a relationship and understanding the terms in which that individual might be coming to the table right um, from a cultural lens or a or, or, or presuming that uh, you know a host of stereotypes will be in the room, and then 
being ready to 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 uh, to withdraw or fight those. Like there's a bit of a there's an expectation of a certain type of behaviors that if I behave like that and I behave in an authoritarian way, the patient is ready to like you know run away or or, or be angry at me. So um, there's some nuance. So think about that relationship and think what about what we bring into that relationship and very spend a lot of time i don't know if um i don't know if we we do this or not enough but i i say things in order to see the response of the patient not just to hear a clinical bit of information like i ask something to them elicit a clinical response to then generate a generate a a uh, mm-hmm. a, uh, a plan right to make a to, to decision make with some information right um, I say things to understand who they are as people and how they respond and the nature of the relationship that they're wanting to have. So there's a whole host of uh, really simple things. It's often very nonverbal. Um, it's uh, often like very being open and welcoming and and, uh, and asking basic things and ha- helping them yes. to speak more than I speak, to to hear mm-hmm. hear who they are as people and acknowledge them as a person, and then moving into a medical agenda. So I don't know. There's many things, but I think people want to be felt and seen and experienced as people and um, and not a list of symptoms that can quickly be checked off. But anyway, there's a few tips there. No, thank you. That's uh, fantastic in terms of providing myself, as I've learned over the last number of years working with you, um, but also our, our members and, and listeners, some strategies to be able to help connect with their Indigenous patients. I think one other way that I might recommend is some of the work through the, that Dr. Cheryl Barnaby has done and led um, through the Quality Care Committee and the Canadian Rheumatology Association, uh, together with the Annual Scientific Meeting Committee and, uh, and the Education Committee, to be able to help with uh, learning more um, through um, a, a two-phased uh, approach with a half-day session at early in the year and a full-day session later in the year, uh, which we've been doing for the last four years with rheumatologists uh, across the country, and it's been very effective and been able to set up uh, folks that have been able to have that kind of uh, ability to teach and, and be able to connect with other rheumatologists in their local regions, and that may be another, another way to be able to help practice and learn those skills. Um, so I'd encourage all of our members to be able to think about that as an opportunity. And, and I really wanted to thank you, uh, Lindsay, for spending the time today uh, to, to, to chat uh, with me and, uh, and to be able to help educate our, our members and listeners. It's my pleasure. It's uh, been great to chat. Thank you. Thanks to both Lindsay and Raheem for that fascinating conversation. That's it for this episode of Around the Room. Our podcast is produced for the CRA by David McGuffin, Dr. Dax Rumsey, and Kevin Bajnoth. We would like to give a special thanks to the Communications Committee and the staff of the CRA for their hard work. If you enjoyed your time with us, please give us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can also share this podcast with your colleagues and spread the word on social media. I'm Daniel Ennis. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.